Remember Wednesday night. Come and give some uh, kev kev. Some hot kev kev. And other goodies. Some other goodies. And uh, we'll just try to have a good time. We'll uh, commensurate with the Lord and try to have a good time. Which should be a good time. What's your prayer request tonight? <clears throat> Right. How many bypasses? Five or six. Five or six. That's per near. That's about it. That's about all you can bypass. Yeah. Yep. And then. Uh, and then Gene, who is here today, uh -huh. he's going on about two hours sleep. Cause he didn't get in till three o'clock this morning. Okay. And uh, when we left here, he drove up to Chandler. And then he's thinking about driving back down tonight and then driving back up again tomorrow morning by 6 a.m. Yeah, I mean, it's, and why you can't. He, why is he driving so much? He's 73 years old and you can't tell him anything. <laughs> and he's my older brother. <laughs> to get them under, to try to understand what the Lord has for them. The Lord is the answer to everything. Yes, Brother Jim? Uh, isn't that thought a little more prevalent during the holiday yes, season? Yes, <clears throat> Yeah. Well, people struggle more during the, the holidays than any other time of year. So, it makes it that much more important. Brother Jim? Yes, my two friends, uh, James White and uh, Jesse Bean, they're struggling with cancer. 
conversation about that. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know who you call, but for him. He's okay. Getting better. okay. She's asking for prayer for her husband who had a stroke. So remember, Suzanne's husband. Others? Nobody else? Travel mercies for my son. He's uh, coming in from San Diego, so I'm having all four of my kids together for Christmas. Oh, wow. Uh, all the Gordy kids come all the way down to Benson to visit me. All the Gordy kids in one house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're taking over the Horseshoe Cafe one morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, with humility, Lord, and in grateful hearts, we respectfully approach you, Lord, as our Savior, as our, as our God. We look to our Heavenly Father for wisdom, for discernment, and answers. That only, that only you can provide. There are so many of us, Lord, that we have issues, those that are spoken and discussed amongst this group of friends, and issues that we, we hold inside. Lord, we, we, just, we lay these at your feet, knowing that they are truly they are truly above our reasoning and our comprehension. Faith is where we need to turn, Lord. Faith knowing that our Heavenly Father loves us as He created us as individuals. He knows our name. He is, Lord, God, you are not a distant being. You desire an, an intimate and personal relationship with every one of us. Oh Lord, we just, we look to you in these times. There are times when there can be great joy through this holiday season. And there are times, Lord, that there are those that are, that are lonely. Give us the ability, Lord, to, to see it and to seek them out and to bring them on board. 
and to introduce them to our Lord and our Savior so that the joy of eternal salvation, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior can be shared. It can be shared with those we call family and we can share it with those that we call friends. And even those that are standing on the corner with a sign. Give us the strength and the courage, Lord, to step out as Christian soldiers. To do what we call the great commandments. Is to introduce and to sow seeds. Let us please, Lord, be known as farmers. Where we spread the seeds. They fall on fertile ground and they take root. For there's no greater pleasure than looking backward and seeing these young Christians come forward. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation, for the holiday season, and the ability to see our brothers and sisters who may be in need. It's in your name, Jesus, we will always pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Revelation 22. And we're in the last section of verses. We'll begin with uh, verse 13. Revelation 22, 13, if you're ready for the word of God, say amen. amen. I am the Alpha and the, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do this, his commandments, that they may have the, the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs, and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the, of, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Be seated. So, tonight we begin the last, this is our hundredth lesson in Revelation. And we begin the last passage. I'll finish uh, with the scripture next week. Uh, and then we'll we're gonna look at some issues that you've spoken to me about before in regards to where do the dead go and things like that. But tonight as we begin this uh, last passage, we'll first look at the 17th verse and then we'll look at the material that surrounds the 17th verse. The 17th verse is the most important part of this particular passage because in the 17th verse we have two distinct invitations. Two invitations are delineated by the two exclamations, the word come. The first part of the verse is a prayer that is addressed to Jesus Christ. The second part is an invitation addressed to all unbelievers. The first part calls for Christ to come. The second part is the last call for sinners. This is the last invitation given in the word of God to come to faith in Christ. So to Jesus' promise of his imminent return, which we've previously studied in this chapter in verses 7, 12, and 20, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, responds, come. And that the, the text doesn't specify why the Spirit especially desires Jesus to return, but the rest of Scripture suggests for us both a negative and a positive reason for the Spirit's desire for Jesus to return. First of all, in the negative nature, men and women throughout history have continually ignored, rejected, and denied Christ. And they have mocked 
and blasphemed the work of the Spirit. Okay? Uh, Matthew 12, 31 speaks to that. Uh, the ministry of the Spirit is to point people to Jesus Christ. That's what the Spirit does. That's why most times when I give an invitation, I speak to the Spirit. Uh, John 15, 6 and 16, 8 will speak to that. Speaking of, wicked, of the wicked sinners before the flood, God said this in Genesis 6, 3. He said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Do you know what that means? Well, why does he say 120 years? Because from that day forward, it is 120 years until the flood. Okay? In Genesis 6, 3. But notice, my spirit will not strive with man forever. Uh, the stubborn and stiff-necked Israelites, with their hard hearts, provoked the spirit repeatedly during their 40 years in the wilderness as they wandered about, uh, continu continually turning their backs on God. Uh, and then, as we go through the book of tribulation, we see the most blasphemous rejection of Jesus Christ where the rejection of Christ will actually reach its apex in the seven-year period that we call the uh, tribulation as Satan promotes the two most vile and evil blasphemers who will ever live, the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet. So those, and then uh, the, the amount of sin which will run rampant on the face of the earth will, will be way beyond what it is today. So, uh, and, and those two individuals uh, will receive the honor of being the first two people to go to the final lake of fire. So, throughout the long and dark centuries of mankind's sin uh, and rebellion, the Spirit has worked to bring about, the Spirit works to convince you, which we call conviction, and then he caught by conviction, he promotes repentance in your life. So when the, so when the Spirit says He is coming, uh, that means the long-suffering, grieved, blasphemed Holy Spirit echoes that. Uh, when Christ says He's coming, the Spirit echoes it and He says, Come. He, more or less, it's, it's the idea is that it's a feeding for Christ to return. Christ so, uh, the Spirit so desires to have Christ return. So that he can subdue his enemies, so he can judge sinners, and then he can end the spirit's long battle to produce conviction in stubborn and hard-hearted sinners. Okay, that's the negative side. On the positive side, uh, the desire and ministry of the spirit also is to glorify Jesus Christ. But the last view, what was the last view we had of Jesus Christ on the earth? Well, he was hanging between two criminals on cross. He was rejected. He was despised. He was mocked. And the Spirit longs to see his fellow member of the Trinity exalted in the beauty and splendor and power and majesty that will happen when Christ returns in triumph at his second coming. Now the Holy Spirit is not the only one who longs for Christ's return. Okay? Also longing for his return return, it says, and the Spirit and the Bride also come, desires Christ's return. And who's the, the Bride? The Church, and I believe by this time in Revelation, you have to include all the redeemed. Okay? If you diff There's a point in Revelation when you continue to differentiate between the Church and all the redeemed, that you, enter, you will have some problems with doctrine. Because by this time, I believe all the redeemed are crying out for Christ to return. And I, I've talked about that a couple of times, and I've, I've had some people question me, and I've, I've actually provided them additional material to look at. But there's a, there comes a time when all the redeemed, I believe, fall under this umbrella. And throughout the centuries, God's people have waited for, they have prayed for, they have hoped for, and they've watched for the return of Christ, have they not? How many times, how many times, do you remember how many times in your lifetime you've heard people predict the coming of Jesus Christ? I remember way back when I was a kid, people 
predicting the return of Christ, setting dates, which is pure folly. But uh, and why do why do God's people try to seek out a date, a time of His return? I think oftentimes these people are very uh, earnest in their desire, but I think people get weary. People get tired of the battle against sin, and they long to see Jesus Christ exalted and glorified and honored. I'm not alibying their, their, their misdeeds and trying to date the return of Christ, but I can understand. I can understand for their longing for Him to return and take them to heaven to live with Him forever. They long for, they long for a day when these perishable mortal bodies will be transformed into imperishable, immortal resurrection bodies, glorified bodies. And they know that in that glorious day, there'll be no more death. Rebellion will be dealt swiftly in God's kingdom, in the millennium kingdom. And God and the Lamb will be glorified and they will reign together forever when we get to the stage of the new heaven and the new earth. Believers are, in the words of Paul, in 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul says, Believers are those who have loved his appearing. See, it's incongruous for someone to claim to love Jesus Christ and not long for his return. If you're not looking forward to Jesus' return, you need a spiritual checkup. You need to question what's going on in your life spiritually. Believers are destined for eternal fellowship with, with Jesus, and the anticipation of that fellowship should be a source of joy for you even right now. It should illuminate you. You know, the church will never be satisfied until it is presented to God. Ephesians 5.27 says, A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the second use of them, the word come, in verse 17, in our, it, changes, it changes the perspective. The invitation now is no longer for Christ to return. But now the invitation is to sinners to come to faith, saving faith in Christ. And the phrase, and let him who hears say come, invites those that hear, who? So who are we just talking about? The Spirit and the Bride to join with them in calling for Christ's return. Now they, obviously they cannot do that until they come to faith in Jesus. Only the redeemed truly long for Jesus to appear. The implicit warning is not to be like those who have, who uh, the having ears do not hear. It speaks about in Mark 8:18, 8, I think it is. Uh, the idea is here: use your ears to hear the Spirit. See, the one who hears with faith and believes is the one who will be saved. In our Sunday morning study, when we looked at Romans 10, 17, it told us faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, by the, the Word of Christ. Hearing is often associated with, when you see that word in Scripture, it's often associated, you can put a slash next to hearing, and write in obedience. It's implicit, it's implied, when you hear
come, buy and eat. He has come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. You know what they're talking about? Salvation. It's a picture of salvation. You don't need to bring a dime. All you got to do is come. You can have all the wine and milk and everything you want. I'll give it to you without a price. That's an invitation. Jesus, uh, in the Beatitudes, Jesus pronounced those, he said they were blessed, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6. In John 7, 37, he gave the invitation, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And early in Revelation, in fact, all in 21, 6, we looked at, I will give, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely, to those or to him who thirsts. So, there's another dimension then added to the invitation. John now writes, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So, it's an unlimited invitation. Whoever desires. And that's very typical. The invitations given in, in the scripture, in the word, are often broad, very sweeping, they're very gracious offers of salvation. It also illustrates a biblical truth that, it, and, and Larry and I were talking about this earlier, that salvation invo involves both God's sovereign choice, okay, and it, often, it also involves human volition, okay? If I was a if I was a staunch Calvinist, if I was a five point Calvinist, if I believed in Tula. You know Tula? You yeah. know I got to teach you guys. Calvinists believe the five points of Calvinism. Uh, the first point is man is totally depraved. Yeah. Uh, if I was a confirmed Calvinist, a staunch Calvinist, although I don't think Calvinists would recognize today's Calvinists, I would believe in God's sovereign calling. And I, I, would, I, would, I might give you just a little bit of human volition, human choice. Okay. If I was an Armenianist, I would believe, if I was an extreme hyper-Armenianist, uh, I would believe that God chooses no one we all choose. It's our choice. I believe the truth is somewhere in the middle, and God understands all of it. I believe that God foreknows our decisions. Or knows our decisions, but I don't believe he chooses for us. Okay? And I would have some pastors that I've studied with that would really get after me for saying that. But hey, in my humble but accurate opinion. But God saves sinners, but only those, God saves those that recognize their need. Okay? You have to recognize. That's why with churches are full of people that have I'm a Christian, but they've never really recognized their need. And they've never really <coughs> repented of their sin. And without repentance, there can be no relationship with Christ. So the water of life, uh, that's what that's Titan, uh, Titus 3, 5 would call it the water of life. The washing of regeneration is offered freely to the sinner because Jesus paid the price for it through his sacrifice, sacrificial death on the cross. See, God freely offers the water of life to those whose hearts are thirsty for His forgiveness. Those whose minds are thirsty for the truth. And those whose souls are thirsty for Him. Okay? So that's the invitation that's given at the end of Revelation. Now, there's numerous incentives that is surround the invitation. There's at least four that I'm going to talk about this week and next week. There's four clear-cut reasons for sinners to accept the invitation. The four reasons that we'll look at is because of the Lord's person, because of who Christ is, because of the exclusivity of heaven. Like heaven is a very exclusive book. If I understand the, prop, the, the words right, uh, there will be the, the, the percentage of people that claim to be Christians and the actual percentage that will be in heaven will be very small. It is a very narrow gate. And the, the Lord Jesus Christ says, 
many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And Jesus is going to say, Adios. I don't know. And people sit in churches every Sunday under the delusion that they're saved. And without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't be saved. So first I want to speak to, and then the last one is uh, the exclusivity of heaven because of the truthfulness of Scripture, and the last one is because of the certainty of our Savior's return. So I want to look at Christ's person in verses 13 and verse 16, okay? In 13 it says, uh, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, okay? This is Jesus Christ self-describing. And then in verse 16, again, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root. Think of this statement. I am the root and the offspring of David. Have you ever thought about it? I am the root. I'm before David. And I'm his offspring. Kind of an interesting statement. And then... Uh, I am the bright and morning star. So, the first reasons for Je the first reason for sinners to accept Christ, God's final invitation, is because it comes personally from the exalted, majestic, glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord's threefold identification of Himself repeats the same truth for emphasis in three different ways. Since the original readers of Revelation spoke what language? The original readers of Revelation spoke what language? Greek. Greek? Thank you, <laughs> Jesus first identifies himself using the Greek alphabet as I am A to Z. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Okay? First and last letters of the alphabet to emphasize to them. He then says, using a parallel phrase, I am the beginning in the Greek. That word beginning means source of all things. Okay? Doesn't, it, has, it has more meaning than just beginning. And the end, he says, and that word in the Greek means I am the goal of all things. I am the source and the goal of all things. And then he says, uh, and the first and the last, which is pretty self-explanatory, even in the Greek. So it, this is an expression of Christ. Infinity, his eternity, uh, his boundless life that transcends all limitations, and his threefold description describes his completeness, his timelessness, his sovereign authority as the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important to recognize that in this statement there is also a description of Christ's deity. How many Alpha and Omegas can there be? How many first and last? One. How many beginning and ends? One. Uh, and the only one that fits that description can be God and Jesus in the Trinity as, as, as Jesus expects, expresses himself as a personage in the Trinity. In 1.8 one, in, one in Revelation, God said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Those were God's words. So there's a direct correlation in the book of Revelation. In 21.6, he will be described as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In Isaiah 44, 6, God, God declares of himself, I am the first and I am the last. Okay? All of these, all of these correlations so you'll understand the deity of Jesus Christ are very important things. Any religion that teaches you that Jesus is any lower than God is a false religion. Okay? So all three titles, which can only applied to God are used here of Jesus Christ, and that, that offers up a convincing testimony as to his deity. Jesus is not a created being. Okay? He's not a prophet. Uh, he's not merely a prophet. He's not a, merely a great moral teacher. Jesus is not the brother of Lucifer. Jesus is not a misguided martyr. Jesus is the Son of God, and He is the second person of the eternal Trinity. Okay? That's who He is, plain and simple. So salvation in Jesus Christ 
is the theme of Scripture. It runs throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, go back to the ark in which Noah and his family were saved. The Passover lamb, the kinsman redeemer are all pictures of Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ in his uh, in his in, in his incarnate coming fulfilled more than 300 Old Testament prophecies, and, and he'll fulfill many more with his I think oh, another over 300 prophecies in his second coming. He is the focus of the New Testament. The Gospels record his life. They speak to his ministry, and then the rest of the New Testament builds upon the Gospels and builds doctrine and practical applications for our everyday life. It's like a a mushroom cloud, okay, as it expands. To be saved is to be saved by Christ. To be a Christian is to be in Christ. To have forgiveness is to be forgiven by Christ. To have hope is to have hope in Christ. It's as Paul wrote in Philippians 1.21, he said, to live is Christ. So back in our text, further, Christ further identifies himself in verse 16. Uh, but first he tells John, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you. You know, though angels uh, communicated the, through angels, the apocalypse for us, the book of Revelation, has been uh, uh, laid out before us. And Jesus wants to know, uh, John, that he is the source of the angels that have come before him. And the expression is interesting. I, Jesus, is the only place that that phrase appears in the Bible. And I believe it's because it's in verse 16, just before the final invitation in verse 17. But a divine call is issued here personally to sinners by the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in the, the apocalypse we see here is addressed to the churches, uh, but it's, it's written to all believers have a responsibility to do what for the apocalypse? Go out and proclaim it to the world before they perish. So in a, again, in an uh, incongruous statement, an inconsistent statement, Jesus declares himself to be both the root and the offspring of David, the same person. And what he is saying is that he is both the ancestor to, he's the root of David, and he's the descendant of David. But understand that that phrase sums up biblical teaching on who Christ is. It really is the biblical teaching on Christ's two natures. Only the man God can be David's ancestor as God and be his descendant as man. See, in his deity, Jesus is David's root, while in his humanity, he is David's offspring. And then finally, Jesus describes himself as the bright and morning star. And in the ancient world, when you called somebody a star, it's kind of like it is today. It meant to exalt him. So Jesus calls himself the bright and morning star. Uh, Balaam, you know, Balaam, even though he was a greedy prophet for hire, God used him, nevertheless, for an accurate prediction of the coming Messiah. In Numbers 24, 17, he said, A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. A star shall come out of Jacob. Peter wrote of the time when, uh, in 2 Peter 1.19, he says, The day dawned and the morning star rises in your heart, speaking about Christ. And right here in Revelation, Jesus has promised the overcomers at Thyatira, he's told them that he would uh, give them the morning star, back in 2.28, I think it is, uh, promising himself to them. As the morning star heralds the arrival of a new day, so Jesus' is coming will herald the end of the darkness of mankind. It will end uh, and will herald the coming of a glorious day of his kingdom. After all, Christ is the light of the world who calls sinners to drink of the water of life. And to those who heed that call, he promises in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says, Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John 6, 37, he says, the one who comes to me, listen, the one who comes to me, listen, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast him out. 
all you got to do is come. Jesus isn't going to reject you. So that, that speaks to that first item. Next, the, uh, uh, and the first item is the personal <coughs> invitation of the, the King, Jesus Christ. The second one is the exclusivity of heaven. And 14 and 15 speak to this idea. It speaks to how it's, heaven is an exclusive club. And the, the section begins with the seventh beatitude in the book of Revelation. Uh, and a beatitude is just a blessing. Jesus, in seven different places in the book of Revelation, there's a beatitude, seven blessings. Uh, of course, we're, we're familiar with the beatitudes uh, in the book of Matthew, but it, even here in Revelation. And he said, blessed are those who do his commandments. Okay? Blessed are those who do his commandments. I don't particularly care for who do his commandments. The NU, the Nestle's uh, Ulan translation, which is the 27th edition, is the best Greek uh, writing on the, on, the, on, the, on the scriptures. It says, blessed are those who wash their robes. to be 
in the Lamb's Book of Life. So, uh, you know, some people get upset because of who's the first ones that are excluded? Who are they? Who are they, Lynette? They're dogs. But these aren't the dogs. These aren't our dogs. You know, I have a special dog. He's really the nicest dog in the whole world. And, but in ancient times, dogs were not domestic. Dogs were not household pets. Dogs were, 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 were weapons and they were uh, despised by most people. They, they scavenged uh, city garbage dumps and they were mean. Uh, so to call a person a dog was to describe someone of low, low character. Deuteronomy 23.18 is the first time that we, I believe in the word that you will see uh, humans described of as dogs, and what's pictured there are male homosexual prostitutes, okay? Sorcerers, we were talking about this yesterday in uh, Mexico. Sorcerers comes uh, from the Greek word uh, pharmakos, pharmacia, in, in Spanish it's pharmacia, pharmakos in the Greek, and it refers to people that are engaged in the occult, and the reason why it, the word pharmacia you know, we get the word pharmacy, pharmaceutical from this word in the Greek, is that oftentimes sorcerers in the ancient world used drugs. And usually their sorcery involved uh, sexual activity. And there were some of those people in the church, you know, in the church of Corinth. So, and then murderers are excluded from heaven. There's another list. We just looked at back in 21 -8. Idolaters uh, are, uh, are listed as those who worship false gods who, or who worship the true God in an unacceptable manner. There's people that go to church every day that are, are every week that are idolaters. The final group excluded from heaven are whoever people who love and practices a lie. Okay? Have you ever lied? Okay, so the question is, see, this is a list. But it's not, not a list. Because just because you have committed one of these sins doesn't mean that you're on the exclusion list. What it means is if you have committed these sins and you love these sins, okay? If you live these sins and you live your life in this sinful nature, you'll be excluded from heaven. This is of those that love and habitually practice these sins. They... They would rather hang on to their sin, they would rather cling to their sin and refuse Christ's invitation to salvation than to accept Him and be saved from the, uh, from the lake of fire. So, uh, just because, you know, because I, I know I have lied, uh, but I do not consider myself to be a practicer of lies. Uh, I, I, Whenever I recognize myself, I know I have been an idolater. Uh, but when I recognize idolatry in my life, I repent. I confess of it and repent. So the difference is, uh, what wins in your life? Who wins in your life? Does Jesus Christ live? Because we talked in Romans 4, or James 4 this morning. Who wins? Are you a lover of Christ? Or are you, a, are you one who's an adulterer and adulteress and who has been deceived by the world into loving the world? That's the decision. That's the, that's the choice. What's that? You, you're, you're discussing right now. James 4.4? 4. Okay, James. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yep. And James uses that word adulterers and adulteresses because that's what exactly he means speaking to, and he actually is speaking to Christians. He's speaking to people that have fallen in love with the world. And because they've fallen in love with the world, uh, they're struggling. Yes. That whole, probably the first second, the first seven verses of, uh, of James 4 would be good for you to read if you wanted to examine that in its true context. Okay?
buddy? Some Wednesday night. <laughs>